the point of these sessions, as ever, hi Caitlin, is to uh, find two interesting people, give them 30 minutes or thereabouts to talk about pretty much whatever it is that they want to talk about in the vaguely in the in the realm of, of thinking about the world in terms of cybernetics and systems. Um, and then um, try and synthesize the things that have been said into some sort of coherent view of the world and sometimes that works beautifully and sometimes it's a little bit odd and sometimes it's a little bit of conflict in it um but it's all done with the intention that we should learn something that we didn't know when we started at five o'clock we know something different or we're certainly different people two hours later so that's the game. Um, there are no prizes other than um, the, the, the pleasure of each other's company. Um, and there are no rules other than general rules of, of sort of civilized conduct. Um, so tonight we have two speakers. We have Boris Hartman joining us from Slovenia. Um, so thank you, Boris, and welcome. And we have Malcolm Cowood joining us from, from slightly less exotic West London. Um, but yeah, um, Malcolm's got a flight path to contend with, so that's, um, that, that's his challenge for the night. So Boris and I have been in a, in a, in a conversation on and off for several months. Uh, I'm delighted he's joined us. Uh, real passion for, for the cybernetics subject. Um, and he's, he's put a lot of effort into, into making sure that, that, that um, working. Is it your second language or your third language, Boris, English? English is second. Second language, <laughs> no, okay. I'm sorry, a third, third, yeah, second third. is Serbian. <laughs> okay, so we're going to have to listen hard, everybody, and, and make sure that we, we understand Boris's intent. So primary education in, in sports and health um, with um, a University of Mathematics degree in pedagogical, can't even say it, pedagogical, pedagogical informatics, apologies, I'll get there eventually, and an MD in social pedagogic, pedagogics, using theories of Ashby Maturana and powers. And then 40 years of working in the field of education and schools, uh, including some European social fund projects. So quite a history there, Boris, um, for, to, to build on. And Boris's theme for this evening is to talk about how organisms, organisms function, uh, drawing on Ashby, Maturana and Powers. So I'm not going to say any more than that. I'm going to invite Boris now to share the screen because I know he's got slides for us, um, which is the key bit. Can I, can I say something before we start? Uh, I'm going to get you share screen now so you can do that. And it's over to you. I'm going to shut up. Thank you, Boris. Uh, I would just like to say something. I was also 22 years in a cybernetic group, PCT. I'm, I was talking to people then, I was a member of the uh, control system group. So I'm not so uh, ignorant in cybernetics, you know, I just wanted to say that. Okay, uh, can I start? Yeah, you should be able to share the screen. Hi, Abdul. And if everybody else mutes themselves, that'd be great. Uh, it doesn't want to start. Try again. I can start it. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so today's team, as uh, John said, is, is basic function in or of organisms. Uh, it's projected mostly on works of Ashby Maturana powers, including also Wiener and contemporary scientific findings in biology, physiology, and neurophysiology. So presentation is mostly scientific. Uh, the beginning of cybernetic goes in 1943 with uh, the known article behavior purpose. Boris, you need to move the screen about, on. Uh, what? You need to move your slides on. Aha. Uh -huh. You mean? Can you so? put yourself? If you put yourself on slideshow and then click through, because I can't control your slides from here. Uh, You're sharing the wrong screen. You're sharing the PowerPoint tool rather than the presentation mode. Uh, do you see the screen? We can see it, but you haven't moved it onto the second slide. So you need to put it on slideshow so that it can move through. Is that OK now? Anybody read the um, language at the top to get the... Um, Boris, if you go to the bottom of the screen, just yes. next to that slider, left of the... Keep going right, right one, right two more. 
not that mm. one. Uh, two, go right. No, go right. Right. And right Ooh. again. Oh! Yay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now when you press space, it should advance. Uh, you yeah. if you go to the far right, that icon at the far right, that one. Yeah. Yeah, that no, one. I, uh, I have a problem. <laughs> okay. Is this okay now? Yeah, that's, that's, that's good enough. Okay. That's brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. So, uh, the big, uh, as we say at the beginning in 94, then uh, winner's book 1948 about control and communication and uh, cybernetics going from word Kubernetes, meaning steersman and sky pilot. Or the German interpretation of all, uh, or, or, or is a used meaning uh, of the word cybernetics as steersman. Uh, I used uh, original uh, uh, inner explanation as new science of, of, of control and communication. My opinion is that such an explanation of cybernetics emphasizes the theory of pilot governing or the other earliest and very well explained life example of purposeful behavior. Organism create and uh, achieve goals, purposes, wishes through control loops, feedback, and so on. Uh, steersmen, steersmen produce goals and uh, try to achieve them through control and communication in organism in varying circumstances. Uh, varying pathways for nervous system, sensor factor, enable steersmen to creatively solve the problem while achieving goal goals in varying conditions. In 50s and in 50 to 60s, control theory made strong influence from cybernetics into the world of natural and social sciences. Organisms functioning uh, 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 in shape of negative group, control loop became a regular part of physiological books and medicine, which explained that there are thousands of uh, negative control mechanisms in human uh, body. I say this because uh, powers stated that uh, probably the whole organism is working like a, a synchronized uh, negative control, uh, control loops. It can be also positive and uh, uh, feed forward. Uh, organisms function in shape of negative control loop became, uh, oh, I'm sorry, in that time a control theory was, was introduced into psychology. There are many opinions, but I think that uh, first we introduced uh, control theory into psychology was uh, with the powers I have some reasons to believe that. Move uh, the slide on, theory. Boris. What? Move the slide on. I don't understand. Move the slide. Next slide. Oh, yes, 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 sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, my, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, 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 usually in psychology, uh, Control theory is known as self-regulation or some of that meaning. Uh, the real title, uh, the real title of this uh, presentation will be, or the, the theory that is behind, will be dynamic biological living control system or DBCS. I coined the term uh, from uh, the term uh, offers. Dynamic stands for SB biological from Maturana and control systems. For power. So the goal of presentation is control functioning of organism. Uh, in, integrated uh, DBCS theory is about cybernetics uh, view on organisms functioning on cell governing living system for control mechanism. The main frame for DBCS is Ashby's book Design for a Brain which is mostly about ultra stability in the dynamic homeostatic, homeostatic system. As, in as, as by Ashby's words, all behaviors are homeostatic. Uh, a winner, Rosenbluth and uh, Bigelow gave directions to cybernetic as new science. And uh, winner emphasized that any complete textbook on cybernetics should contain a thorough detailed discussion of homeostatic processes. Uh, however, uh, this book is rather an introduction to the subject. The theory of homeostatic process involves rather too detailed knowledge of general psych physiology. And I think that the physiology is uh, the, what I added to uh, this, uh, uh, to the theory of cybernetics. Uh, Ashby and 
Our Bamano um, Pinion uh, contributed to basic model, uh, ASB concept of dynamic system, genetic pattern, ultra severe immediate effects from essential variables to nervous system gating mechanism, and uh, PARS is a Ours organism is a result of multi control units functioning. Control units are synchronized and coordinated. Control activity and coordinate control activity, control of perception, chromatic reference and actual perception, and, uh, and error correction, corrective actions. Reorganization with another living beings function is closed system maintenance of auto pace and adaptation, plasticity of nervous system, biological experiments. Uh, DBCS is also. Uh, integration of many physiological and neurophysical. The main uh, diagram show uh, all these principles which I told and all, all the offers and all the, what was somehow uh, available from cybernetics. Uh, it's showing, uh, it's showing closed system and uh, feedback loops which are going inside uh, and outside. Uh, a little bit difference is the parts use uh, comparator. I used integrate and coordinate because I think uh, that is the uh, of the characteristics of neurons. Uh, the other part, the the other the other part uh, upper the, the outer part or upper uh, uh, part of diagram uh, shows uh, the control of going through the external environment. That was the mostly. Uh, what was presented in the past, uh, but uh, also management powers uh, did uh, something like that, but uh, we'll see that later in diagrams. Uh, Maturana uh, show and uh, uh, and uh, uh, Maturana and physiological agency show that primary and most important are control inset organisms because it's work is working as a clothes uh, system and that uh, keeping the chancellor variable inside physiological limits that was also uh, winner's reasoning uh, despite just a minute uh, despite the weakness of uh, powers pct diagram 205 to 208, my opinion is that uh, he made closest outside diagram to control processes for external external environment. as control of perception, which can be applied to both environments. Through environmental effects of output organism tends to minimize the difference between wanted perception, reference, and actual perception, forming error in output, which among the other effects also cancel the effects of disturbances. Uh, that was uh, that was uh, approximately part of the definition of control, achievement and maintenance of uh, pre-selected perceptual state in the controlling system for actions on the environment that also cancel the effects of disturbances. Powers understanding of organisms guarantees that everything is that everything uh, is about perception. Whatever we know, feel is perception. If you look around, what you see here, taste, uh, feel, smell is perception. Our control temps are directed to change perception of environments into wanted goal perceptions. Or in Power's words, 1998, uh, our only view of the world, real world is our view of the natural neural signals that represent it inside our own brains. When we act to make a perception change to our more desirable state we make we, when we make the perception of the glass change from on the table to near the mouth we have no direct knowledge of what, what what we are doing to the reality that is the origin of our neural signals we know only that the final result how the result looks feels smells sounds taste and so forth it means that we produce actions that alter the world of perception so with whatever we are doing we are changing only perception you will you can look around and you see that what Ever is happening is, is, is changing perception. Uh, it, it can mean that also reality is changing with that, but uh, not always. <clears throat> Maturana, Maturana contributed a lot of biological experiments. Uh, I didn't see that uh, he uh, contributed any model, but uh, he had uh, he 
offered many uh, experiments. Uh, I will just mention experiments with Lagella bacteria, although he's mentioning also others like Ameba and so on. But this is the most interesting uh, because the when we put uh, bacteria in a suitable environment, when a grain of sugar has been put, we can know that bacteria stops its tumbling behavior, changing the direction of rotating flagella and, and heads to the zone of great sugar concentration, following the path of, of its gra gradient of concentration. Process is known as chemotaxis, and it uh, seems that bacteria is controlling input. Now, how is that possible? How such a microscopic organism can be so smart uh, to, to, to know what to do what. Uh, it seems that tumbling means seeking for the food and swimming in the direction of the food molecules means that bacteria is feeding. How molecular structure and uh, biochemical reactions are organized to enable control because uh, this is obviously goal-directed goal -directed behavior of the microorganism, which is probably old four billion years. Uh, we'll keep the basic assumption We keep the basic assumption that essential variables has to be kept in, in physiological limits. So I just put uh, here one uh, table, which is from Guyton. It's probably the most famous uh, medical book. You can find uh, these uh, essential variables in any physiological book. Uh, to make clear vision, what means essential variables and uh, importance of essential, it's let us imagine visit, visiting a doctor. We can say to doctor, that we are feeling bad, what is wrong with us, and so on. He can conclude and make diagnosis. Oh, he's ill. That he he has. We have to do that or that. But uh, sometimes we have to go in the laboratory to see which essential variables are heading outside the limits. If you probably know what kind of uh, what I'm talking about, and on the basis of results of laboratory tests, doctor will possibly advise the change of our lifestyle at least for a while. Uh, or medical treatment so that physiological limits for essential variables are achieved against some diseases like diabetes demand permanent change of life, injected, reg injected regulation of glucose into blood. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, the basic negative uh, feedback loops in Ashby were, in Ashby's work came from essential variables. We see this, uh, we see this uh, dial, you see it? It's, it's, uh, it's heading to nervous system and then through reacting part, uh, again, through the environment to the uh, essential variables. This is outer, uh, outer uh, control loop. Uh, okay, the basic rules uh, are when the essential variables are out of the limits, probably uh, the whole system will be out of the, out of the limits. And uh, if it's inside the limits, the probably the, uh, the uh, organism will, will be getting toward uh, homostatic conditions. Uh, a diagram as a diagram uh, from Ashby was uh, used uh, an example of uh, behavior of the cat by the fire. If uh, when experienced cat uh, approaches the fire, heat essential variables will worry and cat will try to keep them inside li uh, physiological limits. Experienced cat is adapting the distance from the fire on the place which is appropriate to skin temperature and internal receptors, causing no displacement, displacement in essential way. We can say that actions of the experienced cat are homostatic. When it's unexperienced cat approach fire, uh, it, uh, it will maybe come too close to the fire, even burn, get burnt and so on. Essential variables will be outside the limits and uh, uh, cat, uh, cat's uh, nervous system will have to seek for the uh, for the control that will uh, keep uh, that will return essential variables into limits. Unexperienced cat uh, nerve starts seeking appropriate pathways for nervous system that will minimize displacement in essential variables and stopping the pain. We can conclude that unexperienced cats, trials, and errors for a system of neurons is goal seeking for homostatic, for, for homostatic stability in essential variables. So we can say that organism is adapting by trials and errors or by error correcting through gating mechanism. 
Uh, learning uh, in this, uh, this definition could be that uh, can be defined as goal seeking process for neural net to find uh, effective feedback uh, path through essential variables with, which will uh, not produce errors. Parse upgrade to getting a mechanism. Uh, powers uh, upgrade to upgraded getting messages and introduce internal hierarchy of negative control loops, uh, which interact with each other for reference signals initiate and initiate error correcting mechanism. Uh, he tried to harmonize organism through control units into integrated whole. So uh, his idea was that whole organism is uh, somehow uh, uh, is. Uh, assembled from uh, control units and uh, they work synchronically. Uh, this is uh, how he uh, imagined uh, the control hierarchy. These are control units which are, uh, which are uh, in cascade uh, uh, follow the reference signal from uh, the top hierarchy to the uh, reacting part of to the behavior parts. And uh, the problem uh, with the diagram was that it's uh, only a behavioral part was uh, somehow atomized into uh, control units. Uh, there's missing from genetic source, is missing to increasing or essential variables, is missing connection and uh, connection is missing also from the intrinsic variables to the uh, hierarchy, a hierarchy of control units. Uh, we, uh, when we talk with, um, when we talk with, oh, uh, okay, <laughs> this is, I'm sorry, uh, I, I saw that there's something, I missed something. Okay, now this is the diagram that I was talking about. Uh, so we see uh, missing, uh, missing uh, connection from genetic source to intrinsic variable and missing part, missing connections from intrinsic variables to hierarchy, hierarchy of, uh, of uh, what is that happening? I don't understand. Oh, no. Uh, this is another diagram uh, which, uh, which uh, uh, Powers made after our long, long conversation. It was about two or three months, I don't remember well. And uh, he uh, connected a genetic source to the uh, intrinsic variables, which are essential variables in SB's terminology. And so the essential variables got reference uh, references for the physiological limits. Uh, before organisms couldn't function, if there are no physiological limits, uh, references for physiological limits, then we don't know how much oxygen we need, how much uh, carbon dioxide is too much, how much potassium, how much, we don't know what concentrations uh, should be in organisms. So this, uh, this, made, uh, uh, this made understandable uh, this part, but this part still uh, waits because the question mark is on the top of the here. See, if you see this question mark, this question mark is only saying that we don't know uh, how uh, 11th level is uh, getting reference signals for the whole system. Uh, now we have to solve this problem. Uh, this is the diagram which I made on basis of all this uh, discussion we, uh, we made. And we see that, uh, I, hope it, I hope we see that this is genetic, genetic source which is uh, of course uh, preceding uh, the references for essential variables and essential variables. Displacement is, is essential variables is um, going up the heresy or in ascending uh, sensory uh, lines or whatever. <laughs> then to the top of the hierarchy, hierarchy uh, uh, the top of the heresy, uh, standing uh, as uh, powers would say, set of errors. Now the errors are uh, differences between references and uh, displacements, displacement in uh, essential variables. And uh, they are traveling uh, through the heresy up 
and uh, in uh, they can be resolved on any level but uh, probably some uh, will uh, will find uh, will be on the top uh, uh, and on the top and at the top we see that uh, there are uh, some uh, some uh, set of errors now which take role in forming preferences both on file level control and can be hunger first now this this dyspnea visceral pain bladder or bowel hyperthermia hyperthermia also control can be sensed uh, for instance for release of adrenaline or other hormones in the body References goes, uh, which are formed uh, from the organs functioning, uh, goes downward of hierarchical hier control. And uh, for decision making process, uh, usually decide which uh, most probably, probably the, uh, which, uh, which are probably the uh, most, uh, which, which, which errors have priority. You know, every, in every process of decision, uh, we can see that uh, some some uh, selection of priority has to be made. We are also in life, we are making priorities, uh, if you understand what I mean. Uh, besides, uh, yeah, besides, uh, besides uh, control, uh, I also uh, uh, make this here, you see, uh, looking like uh, evolution, uh, some high evolutionary change. Uh, some of the we see as evolutionary uh, development of organisms and on every level, on genetic RNA, DNA level, or a level with DNA and essential variables and first level and so on, uh, there is needed homo homostatic adaptation. Uh, if that homostatic adaptation is the uh, matter fall apart, so only only those uh, structures which were which uh, bear uh, homostatic adaptation, they were uh, they uh, uh, through billions of years they uh, form organisms. Uh, also, uh, then uh, if you go downward uh, downward we can see that also higher levels can control lower levels although uh, that is not happening uh, in most individuals cannot control but if you uh, find some yoga master uh, he will show you how you can control uh, the lower levels uh, voluntary so it's very hard to control lower levels that there is a lot of training but uh, involuntary control shows that uh, the influence of the uh, uh, higher levels to the lower levels is uh, quite uh, strong. For example, fear or panic attack uh, can initiate fight or flight or freeze response actions, emotional stress, uh, just a minute. Yes, fear attack, emotional stress, seizures can induce a sudden cardiac attack, chronic stress can lead to peptic ulcers and so on, sleep deprivation, Cognitive activity can initiate sex roles and nervousness can lead and so on. Uh, about five minutes, Boris. Yes, high levels. Uh, oops. Uh, yes, the main, the main question is uh, whether the, the main question is whether uh, Powers was right with uh, atomizing uh, the organism into uh, control units. Neuron networks alone, even most primitive nervous system uh, can synaptically integrate into networks called circuits. And uh, circuits in the nervous system are local, usually local. And this, uh, this uh, uh, circuits local can, uh, can be uh, ato atomized into microcircuits. And so these microcircuits have also some functions, specific functions, and so on. Uh, it's uh, the idea is that uh, uh, the low will go into the uh, into the uh, tissues. The more uh, micro secrets uh, there will be. So uh, I think that th a theory of uh, powers uh, can be can be confirmed, and uh, it can be 
It can be uh, used for researching and uh, so on. This is the just the example of the area control which we saw in a previous model. Now this is just uh, atomizing to slow, to little uh, to micro units and so on. We can do it uh, more. So atomizing we can do to uh, all levels uh, on all levels and so on, uh, so that we can see how structure of uh, control units work. Uh, I think that uh, DVCS model function is, is plausible uh, with biological, physiological, and neurophysiological findings. Knowledge of many silences will be needed uh, to uh, maybe uh, confirm some, some parts, but mostly uh, I think that uh, a model is working uh, and is workable. And uh, as cybernetics is somehow uh, to uh, somehow science which can integrate uh, a lot of knowledge uh, and uh, of many sciences uh, into bigger big picture of the universe world living beings and technology uh, but uh, as i said we'll need uh, more research work and more integration of uh, scientific knowledge uh, into this model uh, I would just like to uh, say that uh, well, this is the this is the uh, uh, that communication between hierarchical control areas or levels or micro inside levels can cause also beside cooperation also conflicts and for now uh, the, it looks good uh, what I was uh, trying to uh, present. Now this is the ending and uh, this is the literature in which we see that uh, most, <laughs> most books are physiological and narrow physiological. Uh, it took time uh, to read all this because uh, they are not uh, unified, you know. Uh, they're a little bit different uh, showing the organisms and uh, uh, but uh, the most powerful books uh, always have to thousand or three thousand pages and it's hard to get through, uh, believe me. <laughs> if you try uh, to uh, uh, to see what I was uh, doing and how they came to this uh, knowledge, uh, you will uh, you will have to read all this, <laughs> uh, and it, it will take time. Okay, thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you, Boris. Really, uh, really interesting. So I've written down as as I always do um, a whole bunch of, of, of really quite important questions. Um, so um, as ever, we'll take a couple of questions now if there are some from the floor and then we'll carry on the second one. Then we'll try and synthesize again at the end like we usually do. Um, so uh, Julia D, interestingly, the appendix, which was not considered to be of any use is now identified as a communication center. Would you care to elaborate, Julie? Julia, sorry. Uh, no. I I, I, I try to you? Give sound a little bit more, yeah, because I can't, I can't hear well. Okay, uh, Julia, uh, hang, hang on, Boris. Let's, um, let's, let's, let's. Uh, Julia, uh, hello. Hello, I can hear you. Uh, right, sorry. Um, I, I think I've gate crashed uh, um, by mistake. But uh, if when you were saying about the control um, of um, of various functions within a body at various levels. Um, you, it, it was uh, it's something that's only just recently been um, identified that um, that the um, bio uh, the um, all the creatures that live within um, the appendix and the gut communicate uh, via the appendix to the brain, um, and it is something that's just. Uh, recently uh, been identified. It's just uh, amazing that all this time we've um, thought it was something that could just be dispensed of readily and we can do without, whereas in fact it's um, it is part of our survival mechanisms and uh, it's something that's been um, developed separately by organisms, uh, something like um, I think it's eight different um, times it's been reinvented as part of a, a, a body so where people have assumed it was 
um, something that's withering and useless and part of something that uh, we never needed. Um, you know, it's just it, that that was quite interesting. That, that's, that's, that's nice. So, so Margaret's picked that thread up already and said, can you provide oh, a, link, a, link, a link to that? Because that's, uh, that, that's probably news to many of us. Eva, you've got your hand up. Yes, thank you. Uh, just following up on uh, what Julia said, I have a question and I hope uh, I don't sound like a heretic. Um, regarding control and communication. Um, I mean, control was the big necessary narrative in the past century, 20th century, you know, to, to justify, uh, to win a war. <laughs> and also to, you know, it, it had to do with the invention of certain technologies, right? And I'm wondering in this century, 21st century, will there be a new paradigm maybe, or more, more focus on communication instead of control? And what does that mean for cybernetics theory? And Boris, I really enjoyed uh, your sense making of how do we need to think of the human in this century? Uh, Eva, I'm really sorry. Uh, I, I really uh, tried to understand, but I hardly understand. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's uh, too sound or I, I did understand what you really wanted, but uh, okay, I'll try to, uh, to guess <laughs> what you wanted to ask. Uh, uh, if, if I understood right, there is a problem to understand why hierarchical control is functioning or how hierarchical control is functioning or something like that, no. I think Boris, do you want Boris to help? Eva, can I ask you something? Can you write me whatever you wanted to tell and whatever you wanted to ask on my mail? Of course. And we can talk about that in mail because when I read, I can uh, easily understand. But when we're talking, I have a problem, so I, I admit. <laughs> no problem. It was also a general question to the whole group. Is it, it's, can I answer Eva at all? You can, you can try, Warren. Yeah, by all means, go for it. <laughs> I mean, I think the irony actually is, uh, Mike's, my reading of the last few decades is it's the exact opposite, that out of Norbert Weiner's work, it was the communication that got taken into the mainstream and that became cognitive psychology. And that's led to this assumption that you can help people just by communicating to them and giving them information. Whereas my experience is, it, is that the way you have to help people is to realize they're controlling agents, that when they lose control of their lives, they're in distress, and when you give them control by listening carefully and helping them get their essential variables back into equilibrium by their own volition, that's the route to recovery. Uh, and so my whole, my whole um, kind of transition for the last couple of decades has been away from communication and towards control because it brings me back to a more humanistic understanding of the world. I so think self-regulation, self self-control rather than externally imposed control. Yeah. Absolutely. I was going to say, instead of a kind of a top-down control, yeah, if, if you kind of almost take away all the connotations of that word, it's almost like, how do you sort of just stay on course? How do you actually, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, one thing that I will be saying in about 25 minutes time is <laughs> how a story, just storytelling is a way of maintaining social control. Can I ask One that? of the things that um, strikes me about Boris's contribution is the control thing, but also the instinctive thing that we've kind of lost. And the story about the cat is very interesting about how it, by instinct, you know, what it does by instinct and what it has to learn. And there's, there's something about that for us as humans, I suspect. We might become over-reliant on how we analyze our bodies and stuff rather than being instinctive enough. So I think it's a very interesting thought about systems and control. I agree. Thanks, Chris. Can um, I ask so something? If I, in, if I can bring in James at this point, and then we're going to move on um, very shortly. I would like to, maybe, uh, John, can I ask something? Uh, did yeah. Warren answer answers to Eva? I, I understood this Warren Mansell answers to Eva questions. I don't know if I'm right. <laughs> Warren gave Warren. a reply. I think there are a multitude of perspectives here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would like you, if you can, really please write to me or we can uh, get on the Zoom 
and we can uh, talk uh, with no problems very slowly. <laughs> but <I would laughs> if, you, if you put your addresses in the chat, if you're happy to, if you put it in the chat box, then you can you can communicate easily. James, okay, one okay, from you, yeah. and then we'll yeah, go yeah. on to Malcolm. So quickly, James. It just just a couple of comments really is is that um, I'm slightly disturbed by the fact that we we deal with complexity and and you know systems. Uh, and what we're trying to do is get to the answer of a complex and chaotic system by discarding some bits. You know, we're deciding deciding which type of control we think is better than another type of control. Uh, and, and there's a reflective moment there as to how do we get to the complexity of the system if we're actually making choices that remove part of the system. Um, and I, the angle that I've been coming at it from it is that we respond to displacement and, and the response to displacement, so Ashby's concept of disturbance, which is disturbance equals displacement, is not necessarily creating control. It's actually sometimes using that displacement to take us out of control on purpose because that furthers our intent and what we're trying to achieve. So... Thanks, James. I think you know, we're not going to solve the complexities of human behaviour, complexity not, science yeah. or, or cybernetics in two hours, but we'll give it a damn good go, as, as always. I mean, I, I've written down so much um, coming out of what Boris was saying that I want to argue with him about, uh, but now is perhaps the moment, because um, actually I want to now hear from Malcolm. Um, so I'll have to find a bit of paper again, Mal. Um, I do, I do actually read it before I before I do this stuff. Um, so Malcolm, um, in, in his own words, um, after failing to submit his postgraduate thesis on political drama, Malcolm drifted into local government and stayed for eight years. Um, Escaping via voluntary redundancy, gained an MSc in human computer interaction, uh, which led to a second career as a technical writer. I won't go on, um, but undoubtedly Malcolm will. Um, <laughs> what he's going to talk to us about tonight is, is um, thanks, Warren, see you soon, cybernetic metaphors. Uh, and, and so, one of the challenges um, uh, is about communication and how meaning is generated. So, I love the idea of metaphors because they're really, really useful. Um, but in finding increasingly that they get in the way of actually being able to communicate with people. So I'm really looking forward to, to what Malcolm has to say. Uh, I'll start the clock again, Malcolm, um, and, and give you your, um, your, your half an hour. Do you need to be able to share? You do? Yeah, so I do, yeah. So I've just shared it now. So can everyone see that? It's just basically, um, it, it more yeah. or less is just a white screen that says cybernetic metaphors. Yeah. Everyone see that? Yes. Okay, so, uh, well, thanks, John, and good evening, everyone. So, um, but basically, um, I only joined the Cybernetic Society uh, last December. And um, so that's not really that long ago. And as such, many of you here uh, won't know anything really about me. So here is a very brief introduction. Now, I'll just continue what John was saying. I mean, I did start out wanting to be an academic but I never actually submitted my thesis, which would have been on political drama and also Marxist aesthetics with a seasoning of half understood French structuralism. I did then just drift into local government. I got the job purely by accident. I hated it. Voluntary redundancy gave me an exit visa. Then I did do an MSc in human computer interaction, which led directly to being a technical author. That job itself then accidentally morphed into being a consultant in the world of business and enterprise architecture, which is what I've done for about the last 17 years till I kind of entered semi-retirement a few months ago. Now, one of the um, perhaps uh, common theme to all this has been my attempt to create what you might call architectures of meaning. Whether that's designing and delivering tra technical training courses to building what you might Call or what I will call an enterprise architecture meta model, which is basically an information architecture. So it's from this kind of experience, this kind of frame of reference, and especially with my newly discovered cybernetic language, I kind of want to explore some cybernetic concepts as I understand them, as well as a few that I actually clearly don't. So as soon as I mention metaphors, I immediately feel bound to reference Lakoff and Johnson's metaphors we live by. But all I'm actually going to say about this book is, is that I agree with that statement, that metaphors are a fundamental mechanism of mind 
that shape our perceptions and actions. Now, this will actually be a common theme. This frames the rest of the presentation in many ways. Now, within the field of cybernetics, Gordon Pask, 1970s, he puts metaphor front and center describing cybernetics itself as the art and science of manipulating defensible metaphors. Now, I find this a little bit of a teasing statement in that I'm not actually quite sure what it means. Now, this more general definition could be getting at the same idea, that metaphors are inherently provocative. And I think John was hinting at that then, just in his uh, introduction. Now, I called this presentation cybernetic metaphors. That's basically just something I plucked off the top of my head when I first spoke to John six months ago. But I'm almost wondering now if a better title might have been thinking with pictures, because that's what I'm actually going to do. Now, as Ben Sweeting, uh, he usually comes to these sessions, unfortunately he's not here today, but as Ben Sweeting has said about design drawings, I actually want to explore ideas rather than actually, uh, I want to use visual images to explore ideas rather than represent some coherent thesis or argument. Now this exploration, which is in some ways quite a bit of perhaps of a personal retrospect, but I do think they might well launch certain lines of thought, hopefully, this exploration is actually um, going to be through a series of, if you like, micro presentations, each lasting about six or seven minutes covering those four topics, which I chose fairly randomly. Now, basically, um, without uh, sort of any real further ado, with that preamble over, I am actually now going to um, play this uh, YouTube video now, uh, I think there is, uh, it, it, it will be sound, so if no one can hear it, uh, do shout. It'll last about just under a minute. Okay, so this clip is actually from a film called Lift to the Scaffold, a French existentialist noir thriller directed by Louis Mal in 1958. <clears throat> now, what interests me is not so much the pictures, the moving pictures, though they, I think, are fascinating in their own right, but it's the music. And what you've just heard here is part of the film's overall soundtrack, all of which was improvised by jazz musician Miles Davis with a band of French musicians that he assembled just for this film. Now, after assembling them, after a few exploratory sessions amongst themselves, this ad hoc band recorded the entire soundtrack in real time as they watched a private viewing of the film, flickering, playing there in front of them. That's the brief story. Anyone interested can find tons of stuff out there on the internet. Meanwhile, I actually think this clip embodies some interesting, is it cybernetic themes? First, the whole idea of improvisation. Now, like most jazz music, perhaps, the band members are making mid-course corrections, which is suggestive of steering and navigation, and with a high degree of situational awareness. Secondly, improvisation, at least as I see it, is not just making things up. That might be free jazz, but that's not improvisation. Rather, I see it more in terms of having some degree of variety as having a repertoire of capabilities, musical themes, motives, riffs, et cetera, that can be recombined into something new. Necessary components perhaps of things like innovation, business agility. And then there's exploration and conversation, two sides of the same coin exemplified in the way that four or five improvising musicians maintain coherence as they respond individually to the film flickering in front of them. And then of course there's purpose. Now Boris mentioned purpose, but I have to say that I've always had problems with this word at least, maybe not the concept of the word. I've never, for example, had any overriding sense of purpose with a capital P. 
Now, anyone who reads David Snowden might actually, you know, have come across the idea that I, and I think this is me, tend to set out with a sense of direction and then see what, what I discover on the way. That has actually been my rather checkered working life. And it's actually how this presentation evolved over the summer, which bears no relationship to what I spoke with John with six months ago. So what this clip embodies for me is a kind of purposeful action rather than being end driven. And what I think I'm trying to get at in this overture, if you like, is that the idea of the jazz band generally is a metaphor for steering or Kubernetes. That's the original cybernetic metaphor. So now let's focus more you know, explicitly on what steering is, which is a metaphor. Now, here is a ship trying to avoid an iceberg and completely failing. Uh, everyone, of course, knows that I'm talking about the Titanic here, which on the face of it was a notorious failure of navigation. But what else was going on? This is the so-called iceberg model, which I think was either popularized or invented by Peter Senge. And you'll find variations of this picture all over the internet. Now, it's basically a model or a metaphor for investigating what goes on beneath the surface, which, of course, is another metaphor. Now, as you can see, there are several layers, different perspectives, I think, for getting to the heart of the matter, another metaphor. But within this context, now let's think of the Titanic not as crashing into the iceberg, but as actually being inside it, metaphorically speaking. Now, of course, this isn't going to be a case study, but as a flavor, I'll mention this documentary, which I saw on the TV about a year ago. I think it's still available and there's the URL if anyone wants it. Now, I do think this documentary does point to underlying trends, patterns, structures. Here's just some of, some of the stuff. You know, there was substandard rivets in the ship's construction, but that was nothing to do with corruption. That's just the way it was. The ship was a steamship and it's, uh, or whatever, but it had a coal fired engine and it set sail being on fire. That was custom and practice. Uh, I think more, most interesting to me is the radio operator. The beginnings of radio operations was employed by Marconi and not the White Star Line. And his priorities as the tragedy unfolded were deeply conflicted. All underpinned perhaps by a culture, so to speak, of imperial arrogance and hubris which is what this article is channeling as a cautionary tale for the modern business. So the iceberg model is about looking for, let's say, all the components of the act, all the different agents at play. And it's a, an approach, I think, that decenters individual responsibility away from blame to a more well systemic analysis where often a multiplicity of courses amplify each other into a kind of chaotic cascade. Now, indeed, this type of analysis has been used in air crash investigations. Now, I will have to confess, I have a fascination with air crashes. I don't think it's necessarily ghoulish, as my wife thinks. I actually think it's because they are classic case studies in systems failure. Now, what they will look at, what the air crash investigators will look at, is everything from individual component failure to maintenance logs to human factors. And that includes itself things like information overload, ergonomics, to an almost anthropological study of crew dynamics, such as the culture of bullying and deference that underpin many of the crashes in the 1970s and 80s. Malcolm Gladwell's written about that, and you may have come across him. And when we start talking about human factors, I think we are in to the field of mental models, which is what you see there at the bottom of the iceberg, and which is what I now want to talk about next. Now, just to summarize, the previous section was looking at the root cybernetic metaphor of the steersman through the lens of both an improvising jazz band and the systemic constraints as represented by the iceberg model. This section looks at the role of mental models, which is itself a kind of metaphor for ways of seeing or ways of thinking. And I'm going to use it as a shorthand for concepts such as frames, scripts and schemas field of psychology and all of which I came across when doing HCI. In the world of rhetoric, we have Kenneth Berg talking about attitudes, which he describes as incipient action. Now, uh, what he means by that is, is that an attitude shapes the way you act in the world. But of course, how you act in the world will also shape those attitudes in a circular loop. Now, what I want to do, though, 
is actually come at this now from a completely left field angle. This reproduction here is from the William Blake's poem, Romantic British Poet, this is 1790, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Now, this is how Blake published his poems as paintings and text engraved into metal plates. However, I digress a bit. What interests me are these lines. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear as it is, infinite. Now, in 1954, Aldous Huxley, I think it's 54, Aldous Huxley took this metaphor for his book, The Doors of Perception, which describes his own experiences with the hallucinogenic drug mescaline. Now, this exploration into the world of mind expansion was actually a result of Huxley's interest in shamanism, or what's sometimes called ecstatic religion. However, the book for me is a lot more nuanced than full-on mysticism. This passage has always stuck in my mind where biological survival is possible only because mind at large, as he calls it, is funneled through the reducing valve of the brain. Now, I think there's a lot going on in this quote. First is the image, uh, the image of the funnel suggests something passive, like the so-called Nuremberg funnel, perhaps. Now, the Nuremberg funnel derives, I think, from 17th century Germany. It's a kind of fictional device where you can just pour information into someone's head. And incidentally, I mean, anyone who's done training or been subjected to training will probably know that this is the dominant paradigm for the traditional training courses. But Huxley's reference to biological survival with its connotations of being able to adapt, maybe even steer, suggests to me something far more active and indeed constructive where the brain is more a model builder than a passive funnel. And it's these models that reduce or filter mind at large or infinite reality or whatever you wanna call whatever's out there. Now, here are a few articles that I've been reading recently in neuroscience and cognition. Now, the two on the left are from a weekly magazine called New Scientist, and the two on the right are from an excellent and free online journal called Eon. Now, all of them are actually riffing around some common themes, as you can see in those quotes I've made bold in yellow. But to summarize, the brain reduces sensory inputs, constructs predictive models, which in turn shape how we see the world, which reduces sensory inputs in a continuous loop, as perhaps illustrated by this short animation. Okay, so now let me pause here and here's my first deliberate provocation for the audience. By emphasizing the role of information coming in from the environment, am I actually being anti-cybernetic here? Uh, it certainly kind of disturbed me when I came across this quote. I was reading an article by Ranulf Glanville and he referred to Ash Ashby's notion of the information closed system, which just really baffled me. Now in the same article, Ranulf goes on, goes on to say, while a system is open to information, its organization remains closed. So maybe I am actually okay regarding information, but what does organizationally closed mean? Now, yes, I've subsequently worked out that this is a key feature of Maturana's concept of autopoiesis, self-organizing systems and all that, which is something I think I sort of get. But what is coming into play here are my own mental models where I am perhaps, you could say, tangled up in my own penumbra of connotations, where if something is closed or closed off, then it becomes kind of dead or supernatural maybe, but in either case, actually irrelevant to the way I live my life. What is What was it Wittgenstein said? Whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must remain silent. But rather than remaining silent, maybe this is the point, maybe all of this is a good example of what teased me right at the beginning, Gordon Pask's defensible metaphors, where the sender of the message cannot guarantee what the receiver will see in their mind's eye. Now, I am in danger here of entering the proverbial rabbit hole, which earlier drafts of this presentation did do. So for now, I'll just say I've run out of time. And this is one for the audience, especially in view of, the, of Boris's presentation tonight, which I think very much was about Maturana. Meanwhile, over on the left, just what is the environment as some big homogenous cloud that you see there, and which is very typical of these kinds of diagrams. But this is for me is where I now want to explore the idea of complexity 
through this Jackson Pollock painting. Now, basically, I've had a print of this Pollock painting for about 30 years now. And I often imagine an animated version where if you were to just pull one of those many strands or string-like structures, everything would change. A hyper-connected dance of nature, perhaps. Or for those that like football, think about every touch or every run off the ball changes everything in that dynamic system of multiple agents. It's not for everyone, though. As one contemporary critic said at the time, he saw Pollock paintings as a mop of tangled hair that I have an irresistible urge to comb out. Now, clearly a linear and mechanistic thinker craving order. Now, nothing perhaps intrinsically wrong with that. It can be useful in certain situations. But for my point tonight, it is this entangled nature that is the whole point. Or to use Ted Nelson's phrase, and I think a much better, more powerful word, intertwingled. Now, here's my rather frightening stick man again, outside looking in. It's a kind of, as I say, it's a common way of modeling and it's something I don't find satisfying. So the first thing I wanna do is move this person, this thing, <laughs> so that they are inside this tangled environment where their actions shape or change that environment while that environment continuously changes them in a continuous adaptive loop. Now, slight digression here. Uh, again, this wonderful Eon magazine. I came across uh, an article in that recently about the evolutionary idea of niche construction, where organism and environment co-evolve. Think of beavers building dams. And again, so in a, you know, another question, how is that similar to Matt Durana's idea of structural coupling? Again, question for the audience, perhaps. Meanwhile, what exactly is this entangled environment or other than a vivid and vague metaphor? Well, for me, it's actually a multiplicity of interacting environments. Summed up in Marshall McLuhan's typically witty way with words, a collide a scope of interfaced situations. Now, as for those interfaced situations, just consider a few things. Just think about how the economic, the ideological, and the technological environments are so central to Marxist thought or any kind of um, uh, emancipatory social analysis. Think of the effects of where you live, the climatic, geographical, and the built environment from Zen gardens to brutalist tower blocks. And I think, you know, relevant now, it's interesting to consider the role of physical location and its interfaces with technology, how they are affecting and shaping one's attitude to working from home or going back to work. And then there's your own microbiome. Now, it, it's, it, it, it now seems to me that your gut, your microbiome in your gut directly affects cognitive function. Now, we are ourselves made up of 37 trillion cells, give or take. Um, depending on, and depending on who you read, some 10% of that, three or four trillion other things, so other living things, so three or four trillion of those cells are other living things, which makes the idea of you both decentered and multifarious. Or in other words, it's only really possible to think of the self as an ecology of the self. So rather than an organism such as my stick man being self-determined as per Maturana, perhaps we are in Altizar's term, over-determined. And that's certainly the way my life has always felt like, where best laid plans of mice and men go awry and all that, where improvisation is as much a necessity as a choice, otherwise you're going under. Now, another strand in this painting are these two blobs here almost like chunks of negative entropy, taking in information and energy from the environment so as to resist entropic dissipation. So again, it's an, for me, it's another image, visual image or visual metaphor of an open system. Now, they've also always struck me as distinctly humanoid. And they reminded me of this photograph I dug out recently of these two submerged scuba divers. I'm not sure you can make them out there. But one of those blobs merging into the blue is actually me in the Coral Sea 25 years ago. Now, when you are 20 meters underwater, you totally feel how constrained you are. Your freedom to act depends on knowing that environment, which is in fact what the advanced course, which is what I'm doing here, is all about. It's about being situationally aware. 
So underwater, I am literally constrained. But what I'm actually also trying to guess at here is, also, is the idea of being enabled by those very constraints, for example, through my scuba technology, as well as affordances in the environment. Now, I've come across the term enabling constraints uh, a lot recently, it seems to keep on popping up everywhere. But I don't think it's actually that new. This quote from Frederick Engels in 1877, I think also sums up the idea, which is about being enabled through knowledge rather than somehow floating free. And it certainly describes what it's like to go scuba diving, which is, when you think about it, another instance of steersmanship. Instead of driving a ship, I'm using mask, fins, buoyancy jacket, compass, breathing apparatus, and so on. I've also always envisaged these blobs as uh, dancers, perfectly summed up in Andrew Pickering's metaphor, dance of agency. Now, I came across this phrase in this article, ontological theater, which sketches out a so-called cybernetic ontology, where Pickering uses Gordon Pask again. He, his various cybernetic installations in the 50s and 60s, they are music color and colloquy of mobiles, he uses them as mod models of what that ontology might look like, which is basically a vision of the world that is built on performative interaction. Now, I have to say that these kind of avant-garde participatory installations are really not my thing. But the idea that there is something fundamental about the dramatic, or in Mikhail Bactan's phrase, the dialogic, goes back to Shakespeare and probably beyond, where all the world is a stage which suggests that one's very existence is one of performance of interaction, which is my cue to look at uh, drama and cybernetics. And of course, this is where I came in, not with anything resembling a Paskey in cybernetic theater, but film and music together, which I thought embodied some cybernetic ideas. Now, one of my own first uh, CyberSoc presentations that I attended last winter also looked at drama. It was Canadian academic Tom Scholl talking about the thoroughly second order cybernetic underpinnings of naturalist theatre. However, I think there is something thoroughly cybernetic about all drama and indeed storytelling generally. This book, The Science of Storytelling, came out a couple of years ago. Now, as I was reading it, I kept on thinking it could easily have been called the cybernetics of storytelling. But with a title like that, it probably wouldn't have been a Sunday Times bestseller, as the blurb on the front cover says. Its main idea is that stories are sense-making machines that enable us to control our social existence. It's a social existence that is, to quote something that Paul Pangaro has said about design, to be in the thick of things. Echoes perhaps here of my other metaphors, being entangled, being submerged. And here are a few of my favorites, which are very much about being in the thick of things. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of these much as I'd like to, but let me just take one or two. This is Lantana, Australian film from 2001. Hi, James, Malcolm. Okay, a lantana is a thick and tangled shrub. Now, it's a metaphor that encapsulates what the film is about. Eight characters in a suburban setting navigate, as one re reviewer puts it, their entangled, intertwined social relationships. Now, I actually see similarities with the Pollock painting, but perhaps the most important thing for me is both are cultural artifacts with which to explore the abstract idea of complexity as it relates to people's own concrete experiences. I mean, I'm not talking about quantum entanglement here. And then there's this BBC4 miniseries, Hidden. Now, this promotional image is from series two. Now, I'm not sure you can make out the three characters that are superimposed there, but we in the audience know within five minutes of episode one that they are the culprits. The police don't, and it's through this technique of what's called dramatic irony that the investigation becomes a why done it rather than a who done it. And I think it's a story that could easily be dramatizing the iceberg model where motivations and mental models are brought to the surface. It shines a light on patterns of structural inequality. Though, of course, I am well aware that that last statement also reflects my mental models of, the, of how I see the world. Now, hidden is basically standard detective fiction. Uh, this trope of unraveling and stripping away layers is common in most detective fiction from Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler to Scandi Noir. 
And as such, I think it has the potential to be useful models of social reality, that is models to think with. So to wrap up now, consider this quote from West Churchman. A systems approach begins when you first see the world through the eyes of another. However, I actually think Bertolt Brecht was saying something similar far, far earlier in 1930s Germany, where for him, effective political drama is the art of thinking in other people's heads. Now, this is not just about occupying the minds of his characters, as any writer must, rather to make those characters meaningful and believable as a basis for some downstream real world effect, then you also have to think in the heads of your audience, who are invited implicitly at least to think in the heads of those characters to identify with them, which has a distinctly circular and rhetorical structure to it as perhaps expressed in these lines by Kenneth Burke. Now I'm using rhetoric here in its original sense of art of persuasion, not empty sloganeering. In other words, by seeking to speak the language of your audience, you are addressing the mental models of that audience, an audience that is a socially entangled audience. Or to reference Bactan again, it's a situation where both the actors in the play and the audience as actors are entangled in a state of heteroglossia or many voices, which applies to real life as well as theater, film or TV. And it is indeed how I think I approach the performance of being a consultant, at least I like to think that. So in this section, I've shifted the focus from the dramatic to the rhetorical, from the observed system to the observing system, which leads me to end with a question, what is the relationship between rhetoric and cybernetics? I know it's something that Angus is interested in, but unfortunately he's not here as well tonight. But it's with that question I will actually end. And if there has been an underlying theme to this presentation, it's summed up in that quote, which I interpret as a decentering, or as Anil Seth has said in his latest book on consciousness, a dethroning of human centricity. And I suppose it is with that that I do come to the end. Okay, thank you. Wow, Malcolm, thank you very much. Um, so I will tell you as, as an immediate response that Angus is currently on a Eurostar train somewhere between Paris and London right, uh, right. and decided that trying to make a connection and be here was probably going to be quite difficult for right, you. Right. So, so uh, know that you will pick this up with him at some point in the not too distant future. <laughs> I'm tempted to go straight to perception because it's the common thread between yourself and, and, and Boris, but we'll perhaps come to that in a minute. Um, I love the idea of combing out complexity and as, as I get increasingly bored, combing out anything at all would be sort of quite nice. Um, and then you talked about structural coupling. And so are we using the metaphor as a device for not having the conversation or a device for having the conversation? My intent tonight, I was gonna say purpose, but I did say I don't like the word. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, purpose tonight was to actually try, try and generate conversations. This is the point for me, this is largely a personal retrospective, but the whole point of this tonight was to try and actually sort of generate ideas. <laughs> And it's, for me, it's interesting about that Gordon Pass quote right at the beginning. He says cybernetics is about metaphor. He, he, he's talking, he's saying it, it, that's it, it's front and center. So I'm trying to put more or less say, and I'm sure others have said it, so I think you can find it in Wittgenstein as well with his language games. Metaphor is almost inherent to all communication and that's all we've got. That is actually all we've got. And that's why I sort of like said that Rationally, I get Maturana, but actually, when I think about it, he's incomprehensible to me. So if we actually take that, we might then say that, that, um, that language is a metaphor for communication. Yes, yes, it's, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah that's, I, think, I think, without being an expert, I actually think that's what Pask again was getting at with this conversation theory. Okay, so so T.O. Manning, you have your hand up very politely over there, so uh, why don't you uh, unmute yourself and uh, and speak? Um, yeah, I was just going to say, no, I concur. I've been studying sort of like Pass for a while. I've read his white book and his green book, still a bit, still need to read his um, purple bit book a bit, but a lot of it is down to sort of 
these type of metaphors we kind of like formulate between each other. Um, one sort of notion I've heard is that my concept of my concept isn't the same as your concept of my concept, yet yeah. we do come to an agreement and that. Yeah. And this is through the means of conversation, which entails uh, giving commands, asking questions and explaining ourselves and what we mean by such and such. There's actually quite a lot of overlap with conversation theory and contemporary inferential semantics of the Pittsburgh School of Philosophy, which I found quite weird because there didn't seem to be any sort of overlying sort of connection there but I think through Vygotsky who heavily influenced past that seems to where it came from but if you want to learn more about sort of like um how we come to agreements and how we come to take the perspective of each other's views it might be useful like reading up on I think it's R.D. Lang's interpersonal perception because that's where Pass got a lot of his ideas and that, and also where he came up with some of the proofs for his later interaction of actors theory. A lot of it seems to be borrowed from sort of R.D. Lang to some extent and that. But also in regards to what you said about the art of defensible metaphors, well, you kind of picked up on potentially one by referencing heteroglossia in, um, uh, was it Bakunin? Yeah, like, back they back and okay sorry i think it's thinking the anarchist guy but um anyway past notion of like p individuals or psychological individuals is very similar to heteroglossia not completely but if you look up on um his distinction between psychological individuals and m individuals the way psychological um, individuals are conceptualized in conversation theory, there are some partial parallels to sort of like heteroglossia and speech acts or different modes by which we communicate. So if you have time, I'd say just read up and pass a bit more. But yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, so we've got James, you've got your hand up and then Julia. Yeah, Malcolm, I, I, I congratulate you on a fascinating presentation. Um, I found it really, really, really interesting, and I, I think offline would be really interesting as well. Um, this thing about how do we communicate, if we chunk it up and we don't go down into all these horrible weeds and all this detail stuff, we, we work on something that I, I don't know if anybody else has called it anything, but I ended up calling selective approximation. You know, we all know what a table is. Um, I've done the experiments with people and you give them chocolate, right? You give everybody's piece of chocolate, and you ask them to write down what that chocolate tastes like. And if you've got 15 people in the room, you'll get 15 different descriptions. And you go, so you all understand what chocolate is then? Because we all make our own model of the world. And then we all agree on some kind of selective approximation where we kind of dismiss the fact that we know that all of our approximations are different. But there's this little bit in the middle where we kind of agree. Um, and and I, I've tried, but I don't I, I haven't managed to go down below that level because you just enter this whole world of complexity. And I, and I dropped Robert Anton Wilson into the into the chat because because he really got into it. I don't know whether you've, you've come across him, but he came out of um, uh, the same place as, as Huxley looking at uh, um, Oh God, uh, psychedelics. He came out of the whole psychedelics thing with Timothy Leary. Um, and just to throw one more in, there's a, there's a lady on the internet, which you may or may not have, have seen, to just, it just sprang to mind to sort of sponsor conversation, um, who, uh, Jill Bolt Taylor, who does a talk on TED about having a stroke and she's a neuroscientist. And, and the experience that she goes through is when she's having the stroke is, being connected with everything and then being ego. And, and what she sort of explains is that the left and right side of the brains, which are, one is having the stroke and the other's, you know, not, um, it, it's the, the bit, what one is controlling the other such that it, when they're in balance, we've got this sort of, we understand the other, but we also understand ourselves. And when one gets chomped up, in this case, her, her brain that was ego, suddenly she's she has this connectedness with everything which is the same experience as people have when they go on psychedelics yeah and, 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 and therefore the psychedelics is are controlling the other i guess the other i'm not a neurologist but the other side of the brain which is the ego well so, I, 
I, I would, uh, if, if I may, I'd just say there's two things here, two completely different strands, and, and I hinted at both in there. One is the idea of predict consciousness and predictive modeling. Anil Seth's latest book is, 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 seems to be really popular at the moment, but the slide I showed about those various articles, which has actually been really popular both in New Scientist and in Eon for about four or five years now, is the idea that we, we just create these predictive models. So we have this limited view of the world anyway. Now, what does that mean to practicality? As I was saying, I think with the field of rhetoric and when I was a consultant, I got to the point with not really caring what people felt or thought. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, to the point about BPMN, for example, I mean, it, it makes you want to slash your wrists. BPMN is actually irrelevant. It got to the point of what could we actually do? So in other words, it's not what words mean, it's what words do, which is, I think, a very profoundly rhetorical point of view. And ironically, as much as I say I don't understand Maturana, an article I was reading the other day said that's what Maturana was saying. <laughs> so um, I'm going to include here. So Julia, I've got a question coming in from you, please. And then Mr. Battle, I shall come back to you. Dr. Battle, sorry. Julia. Hello. It was, uh, just that talk about language um, itself being a metaphor. And um, recently I've noticed that uh, politicians quite often use metaphors, but they use imagery. Um, recently um, they have been using language as that kind of metaphor and then breaking it um, and trying to change its meaning. Whereas um, a metaphor, uh, part of its strength is the fact that it is a simplified version of, of what's going on and that it's understood um, we may all have our own versions if you know if you call something an apple you've got an idea of what that might look like um, I've just noticed recently that politicians are getting um, to that stage where they've um, almost given up on, on um, truth altogether and uh, 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 finding that their own metaphors are no longer, um, they can't work within them anymore and are trying to change them. Things like levelling up, um, where they're trying to change um, it, it's the meaning that they sold it as uh, and um, the, the way it's now being um, portrayed. It's, it's just quite interesting when you said, said about language being a metaphor in its own right, a sort of different level. And I just thought, oh, well, that's what's happening there is, they're trying to <laughs> hammer I, 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 if you've read if you've read if you've read um, you know, um uh, what's it called in you know, 1984 um, or, or sort of brave new world is sort of this uh, sort of dystopian novel type type stuff um you, know, you, you get a lot of that and, and certainly we're seeing a lot of new speak going on at the moment i wouldn't wouldn't dispute that at all i mean i, I was uh, reminded as you were speaking julia that somewhere in stafford beer's work and I, I can't remember the book off the top of my head uh, um page 88 of, of um Heart of Enterprise, I think it is. Um, he said, you know, Humpty Dumpty paid his words extra to make them mean what he chose, but he couldn't change the nature of the things that they described. And so there's something you know, really important about, about you know, a lot of the time people use language to, to, to disguise what they mean rather than rather than clarify. And indeed, I think they use metaphors the same way. Because um, I found myself thinking, uh, as listening to Malcolm, thinking about um, are we talking about something which is predictive in our behaviour, Malcolm, or are we using it to be anticipatory? So actually, am I making an assertion about what I think is going to happen, or am I making an anticipation of what I want to happen and adapting my behaviour accordingly? Because I think that's quite a big difference. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> That's fine. You don't have. We don't have to have answers. We have to have questions. That's you know, the, the, these things are about the. I, I, the one thing I will say, though, in answer, though, you know, more to the other question before, is this idea of rhetoric. I mean, you, you know, go, go back to early two thousands. Uh, the MIT lab. I don't know if anyone's heard of B. J. Fogg. Now he wrote a book called Persuasive Technology, and I, being perhaps early adopter of the internet and so on bit of a techno utopian was really excited by this book it's this idea that you could actually use the principles of rhetoric in technology 
Now that's 2004, Facebook, what came out a year later? And what you see now is Facebook is the dark side of that. Uh, all social media is the dark side of that because rhetoric as a whole isn't bothered about meaning, it's bothered about emotion. And interestingly, it might surprise some people, that was actually in a lot of Marxist aesthetics in the 1930s. It's the way that you actually talk to the emotion. So then it becomes a matter of thinking about what is the function of emotion. Anyone else? <laughs> oh, it's fine. I was, I was an elegant pause then to let mm. people think about what they've just heard. So we, we use language to manipulate our world. We communicate to manipulate yeah. the world. To manipulate emotion, exactly. We yeah. use language not to denote what is out there, but to manipulate emotion as a means of steering. That's where I think the cybernetics comes in. That's yeah. where that book, the, the science of storytelling, we are using images, a whole, you know, like tonight, I think someone put there, do you mean simile? I actually was very, very liberal tonight. A lot of them were metaphors. Some of them were just visual images. Actually, I was not making any distinction. It was about a deliberate attempt to actually just use something highly visual to try and affect emotions rather than rationality. I was actually trying to eat my own dog food, so to speak. The thing, if I can jump in, the thing is, you only have to look at Brexit, right? Yeah. To see it was a battle of rhetoric. Yeah. And if you then take it from the perspective of those suffering the rhetoric, there was also the inability to get to the facts. Because mm. every time a, a, a sort of a question was raised, you thought, oh, we're going to get to some facts here. That was obfuscated. Mm -hmm. So, and because people are really busy and they've got very stressful lives, they don't have the time to go and hunt down the facts mm. and therefore they get driven by ma to make an intuitive decision based on rhetoric which is massively dangerous mm. and and there are other similar things i could i won't go into because it's too controversial but there are <laughs> there are other areas where exactly the same thing happens when as soon as you delve into the facts you find out the rhetoric is not the a, a, a true a, a good representation of what other what facts exist for example yeah. i mean for, I, i'll throw one in which is dangerous which is the environmental thing mm -hmm. where the um uh, original film that started it all off was all you know started about all the polar bears dying and and if you look up how many polar bears are dying they don't even know how many polar bears there are mm. so they can't tell you what percentage of polar bears are dying because they don't know how many there are to start with mm. so as soon as you pull it apart but then they go, oh, don't worry about that because it's a metaphor, you know, or a simile or whatever it is. It's, it's, it's just an example. It doesn't matter if it's not true. And, and that's really, really dangerous. So, so you, you've raised two really interesting things there. So you know, a cybernetic you know, interpretation of the world is, is using, let's say, information um, in order to inform action. And, and, that, you know, and, and maybe um, picking up the... the, the Spread right from the beginning, that might or might not be purposeful, Malcolm. Um, if we can work out what we mean by purposeful, so you know, so they're sort of then we're starting to act with let's say let's say that human beings are acting with intent, yeah, um, and they're acting with intent towards a particular end that they maybe in concert with their some of their fellow men have, have chosen. So I wrote down while he was speaking. Um, that it's coercion of the coerced by the coerced. Mm -hmm. So there's a sort of an engagement there. So, so we are we are engaged in the process of coercing ourselves individually and collectively towards some particular end that we think might be important. And um, so, so then I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking, well, how does that fit with what Boris was saying you know, 45 minutes ago um, about um, you know, the sort of perceptual control theory so if we're creating the world that we're perceiving, are we going down a rabbit hole when we start to do that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think we are, but I think this goes to the heart of what complexity is. I mean, one thing I've noticed recently, nearly everyone I'm speaking to these days is into complexity thinking. It's a badge of honor. Who wouldn't want to be sophisticated enough to think complexity? But I actually think it's very difficult and tricksy concepts. The whole idea of a feedback loop immediately creates a kind of almost infinite regress 
Uh, and, and I think this is actually part of the thing. You used the word coercion there, but let's substitute the word coercion with control. Let's substitute the, the quote I made from Engels about just being uh, aware of your constraints. And, and what you've got here is, again, we cannot help but infuse everything we talk about with emotion. And, and I think that becomes, if you like, the battleground. And um, what's his name? Where is he? James talking about the fact. <laughs> uh, uh, what is a fact? Um, again, if Mike Jackson was here tonight, I know he has been picking up that other Russian formalist. What's his name? I've forgotten Bogdanov. his name. But Bogdanov, yeah. Very similar to um, uh, Bactan's dialogical principle is that it's the relationship that matters. Uh, and it's Carlo Rivelli's idea. The entity has no existence other than when it is in relationship to something else. So as soon as you put two entities in a relationship to each other, what then is the fact? Well, there, uh, is no, there, there are no facts. Yeah, right? yeah. There's, there's, only, point, there's yeah. only what we agree mm -hmm. temporarily. It's, yeah. like, it's like what you know Einstein says about the universe. It's a temporary agreement until yeah. somebody works out something different. Mm -hmm. And then we go, oh, I mean, I read an article two days ago about how dark matter is possibly micro black holes, mm -hmm. right? That's the latest idea from, from, from science, and it's, you know, nicely yeah. compelling. But we also know there are, I was at 11, 17, 19 different interpretations of the Copenhagen, mm -hmm. uh, what's it, and, and, and what are we told? It's, it's multiple bubble universes, but there's another 18 options. Well, that's that's it it talks about. well, well there's a the new scientist article about that recently. Apparently it's about five. Uh, I, I, I know. I think the one I really like is orchestrated objective collapse. I only like <laughs> it because it's got the word orchestrated in it. But <laughs> I thought you might be going for the word collapse <laughs> or improvised oh. improvisation collapse. Yeah. That would be your more jazzy uh, approach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Boris, um, I, I want to pick up um, so when I looked at your. Um, I've got written it down, DB, um, DBCS model, um, and, and the recursions of control that you were describing. Um, and then Malcolm talks about you know, using feedback loops and building infinite regression into the way that we, that, that we use information. So I'm looking at those two things. And, you know, your thing was sort of quite redolent of, of, of BSBSN in the way you know, the recursive structure of information. Um, the infinite regression at some point, because you know, various people have disappeared off from this call as, as we've gone on, and because they have children to feed. Um, and and uh, that's sort of really quite interesting. So, at what point are we making a decision? So, in our infinite regressions, if we're if we're locked into, into Boris's world, it might feel like we don't have any individual volition. We are victims of our of, the, of, of our gut and our information system, and we have no, it's a, it's a deterministic universe, we have no choice, which doesn't feel right, because I can decide what I'm having for dinner and when I'm having it, um, or can I? So where are we at in terms of, of, on the one hand, we've got sort of notions of, of prediction and choice, on the other hand, we've got a, a proposal that says deterministic, there is no real choice, we're driven by the, by the, the cells in our gut. It's, I don't know if there's any philosophers here, Theo Manning, you were very philosophical before, but I remember 40 years ago doing my 101 philosophy, and we were introduced to freedom versus determinism, but also something called soft determinism. Now, it's really interesting that all the lecturers in the philosophy department hated soft determinism because it wasn't binary. But for me, it was absolutely the most bleeding obvious thing I'd ever read in my life. It was this idea that, yes, we have agency, but yes, we are constrained. <laughs> I can't say anything else other than that. Or other than that. So, so we exist mm. in a set of systems. Yes. Which we, um, so, so here's a proposal for you. Hierarchy mm. necessarily emerges from the interaction of different systems. Now, whether yes. it's the recursive sort of hierarchy that Boris was describing, or a social hierarchy, or a political hierarchy, just because we interact, it will emerge. Yes, yes, and that's, I would actually say, on a very cursory reading of only the introduction, I think that's what Anil Seth is getting at with his latest book called Being You on Consciousness. 
because I get you know, I get shouted at by people for saying, well, you know, the hierarchy will form itself. All we've got to do is you know, put the people in the room, and we'll see what happens. Mm. Uh, and we can almost you know, we we can almost yeah. see it in this sort of session on Zoom. We, you know, 16 random strangers plugged into a TV screen and uh, a conversation emerges and out of that conversation emerges a hierarchy of we could call it knowledge insight or gobbiness I'm not quite sure but, but, the, but there's also another interesting point which might be a really interesting experiment to do one day again another Eon article I was reading if each of us went away that sounds a bit too much like school doesn't it but if each of us went away and actually described the key points of this session you would probably have 16 different things. Margaret, I've got to come back to you on that one. That's a brilliant, that's a brilliant question. Um, so, and, and I think there's you and Julia left, the other lady, oh, Louise is still here, and Catherine. So for those of you who haven't read it, Margaret has just dropped into the, into the pot. Would women think this way? Um, I don't know, I'm not a woman. So what, how would we think then, Margaret? Speak, please. I think that we are far more uh, collaborative and distributed in the way that we assign controls or interact with controlling uh, um, subsets of systems, if you, if you like. So we don't put ourselves center and top of something or necessarily see a top of unless it's a goddamn man, excuse me. <laughs> but this seems to be something we really do have to resolve in the sense that I, I do think that some kind of hierarchy does evolve in systems but i'm also sure that in social systems it's very much the 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 language that has been used has shaped our concept of what is happening and that this whole other world is invisible to us until women start speaking about how it is for them and uh I'm far more interested in these distributed control systems where you go gathering your information rather than hunting it down, if you know what I mean, and where we're um, far more collaborative and um, interactive, relational, um, rather than transactive. Uh, not that there won't necessarily be a transactive aspect to a relational uh, dynamic, but that there are multiple relational aspects that we're continually controlling with, for, by, you know. So we've got this notion, not just of a homeostasis, but a homeoresis that starts uh, occurring. Multiple levels of calibrating stability points that need to and have to change as these distributed systems engage, re-engage, disengage, etc. So far more fluid dynamical aspect to what's going on than this nice top-down multi-level control system that we had from the 1950s, 60s, 70s. A norm, you know, the man. <laughs> the man seeing things this way because this is the history of our species as we've socially um, started, uh, um, let's say, paying attention to the different ways in which we are as two distinct species of the same species, <laughs> what's the same, uh, what's the biological system we use. Um, so that's my peanut gallery contribution for the evening. Yeah, that's, that's great because the, 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 you know, as long as there has been, let's call With it human the organization, um, <laughs> there has been an awful lot of, of, of hierarchy and, and you know, you go back to the Roman, you know, the Roman army, uh, Roman Empire, two thousand years ago, and it, you know, it had a form of hierarchy with you know, centurions and legionnaires and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and it's going to take more than a few years to to, to shift that way. But if we That's if we treat it as a biological system, um, then the hierarchy also emerges in the biological system. I think you're picking up Boris's Boris's point from earlier. We get a we get a hierarchy in 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 the, in the biome because you know some things have greater influences. Well, well, you don't actually. You get a multiplicity, a mutualism, which is highly coordinated. And I think we're underplaying the role of coordination in creating these distributed hierarchical, and I would then say heterarchical control systems. Yeah. So we're wanting to always make it that one thing is on top and controls things. 
or one state of, of, of you know, sets of parameters sort of sing, sort of little like, but it's actually much more about mutualism and coordination and a distributed functionality than highly distributed functionality. We're looking at how forests operate, for example, and, uh, and I'm from Africa, as you all know, so I'm far, I've got a far different understanding of social social systems than a European one, uh, than necessarily only a European one. And so I've, I've been quite fascinated by some um, black philosophers who are biologists and philosophers and working in the environmental field now, trying to instruct us in, with metaphors based on biology and large scale interactions in forest biome, for example, where fungal networks and mother trees will rather feed nutrients to their own like, their own kind, and, and fungal networks will ship masses of resources right through this, fung uh, this, this forest to species that are unrelated to, to each other. And, and so you get this, it's, it's, it's absolutely an extraordinary, beautiful, beautiful system of coordination and distributed control. So we should have to try that with real organisations as opposed to, you know, to human organisations. Abdul, you put your hand up. Just need more women. Of course. <laughs> hi, John. Hi, John. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, um, fascinating conversation. I've, 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 I've tried to listen in. I think there's a few things I've just made a note so that I don't forget. Um, one is kind of really around uh, what we have an interest in, uh, whether some people tend to have an interest in things or the ten people tend to have interest in relationships. Uh, between things, um, kind of engineering and the social side, and maybe I don't know, as I've kind of matured, my emphasis has changed, and there's been more balance. Hopefully, more more, more movement towards balance. So I, I wonder if there's a, I don't know, um, what what are the factors that 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 make you inclined towards one way of thinking or the other. That's an interesting conversation. I was also thinking about um, uh, vicars and appreciative systems, and the idea that we kind of we go through life uh, and, um, we, you know, kind of I I identify new relationships, managing and deleting relationships almost kind of like, um, you know, like Earth is kind of um, moving through space. We kind of move through relationships as well in the same way. Sometimes we can choose and manage those relationships actively. Sometimes they manage us, mm -hmm. but there's always two ends to that relationship. And quite often we're only talking about our end. Um, that's a, that's a kind of second area. A, th a third area about purpose, really, and, and as you spoke about purpose and interaction and and how it unfolds and emerges, um, you know, and, and there's a you know kind of reminder to myself and all of us, really, there's that there is kind of there is a logical hierarchy that emerges based on the variety you have in a situation, um, uh, and that's contingent on discourse and, and conversation and speaking to others and speaking to others using different language. And kind of leads to my final point uh, around, I think, um, uh, 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 Pangaro's Grey Book, someone was talking about the books and, and, and language and how we, when we want to transform our, not just organisations, but ourselves, we can choose to expand our language and contract language and the kind of exploring. Um, so if it, we contract our language, we become efficient, very engineering minded, we expand our language and we and we, we can start to be a bit more innovative. And then when organizations transform, you, you need to deliberately expand that language, you know, use new terms, maybe with a suffix or a parenthesis. And, and, and you can't really kind of do that without changing the language. And there's that natural kind of inhibition. And we don't you know, we don't um, uh, what does that mean? It's too technical. Um, and that's, I think, a really interesting point. And I think that really also applies to us as individuals in terms of how we attenuate and amplify our own variety and the language we use um, in our own conversations with ourselves, um, which is fine as long as you don't talk back to yourself. <laughs> so, 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 because um, yeah, the, the notion of filters has come up a couple of times during this. Uh, uh, perception is a filter. It's, it's, it's a, um... Yeah, it's a device, um, you know, so, so we use perception as a, as, a, as a filter. So maybe what we're saying, are we saying we use language to both filter and describe our world in order to create the world that we've just described? For, for me, I would say sort of yes. And, and I think that's actually, <clears throat> interestingly, that's almost early Wittgenstein and late Wittgenstein 
combined together is picture theory and is use theory. But for, for me, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of like trying to address what something Abdul just said there and going back to why I use that jazz clip. Now, I don't want to sound kind of arrogant, but I used to try and think of myself as a jazz consultant. Mm -hmm. And what I meant by that was that basically I had a repertoire of capabilities which I deployed according to necessity. So I was both free with intent and purpose, but utterly constrained. If you prefer the cricket analogy, I would love to consider myself Viv Richards knocking up a century and 42 balls, but I'm equally, for those who have the age, happy to be a Chris Tavare spending seven hours to score 60. So it's this idea that I think that it's about situation is all, but it's this, going out to the idea of hierarchy, uh, I don't want to get misunderstood here. I'm not talking about hierarchy in society. And I don't know whether that, uh, uh, I've forgotten her name now, Julia is, uh, is still on the, the, the call. But one of the images, metaphors I was going to use was Simone de Beauvoir's sedimentation to actually be similar to both being submerged and entangled. But I think it's also this idea that what you, you're actually doing here is is kind of just re the, the body itself the biology which you mentioned john a minute ago the biology might be in a hierarchical state from bodily function right through to high level self-actuation i suppose it's a maslow type idea but it's it's you know that, that uh, so i think what i'm trying to say though is that by decentering consciousness that by decentering intent consciousness ceases to be a, an executive function and becomes a monitoring function okay we're going to have to close very shortly and um, so i'm just picking up a thread out of, out of the chat there julia you were talking about um you know, stafford avoiding avoiding um hierarchy and, and emphasizing coordination control and, and indeed he does so when you sort of dis, dis, decompose the vsm um you have the the three strands of control the legal regulatory and, and whatever the third one is um can't quite remember and then everything else is pushed out into a coordinative uh, network let's call it um so you're maximizing the autonomy within the system my work with 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 Stafford himself and, and, and with the ideas over many years um, does suggest to me that there's an informational rather than a social hierarchy that emerges in that sense. So, so uh, and part of that is about um, the things that can be perceived. So, so the, the different, you know, what's he called it, intrasystemic and extrasystemic omniscience, the things that can be seen from different, different parts within the organizational model. Um, but also then the, the information flows that go with that and um, partly our ability to design the information flows, which is yeah, which which does um, yeah, have, a, have a, a human dimension, but also in in systems that um, liberate themselves. The way that I, I find it fascinating to watch the way that information moves around an organisation when we don't try and direct it, when we sort of shut down the information system and let the people communicate, we get that much more collaborative environment, that much more collaborative thinking that, that, that Margaret particularly was, was, was talking about a little earlier on. So there is something really interesting in this space that we need to need to to continue working on because you know we've tried very hard but in you know, in slightly less than two hours we haven't quite solved it all yet um my dinner is probably going to be ready fairly shortly uh, and i suspect boris is very late for his or he had it before we started um can i say thank you to malcolm and to boris for two very very gripping um, and, and insightful um shares this evening um i'd like to summarize them and, and define the unifying thread but i can't um so so I'm not going to make the attempt. What I will do is get the videos put together, get them out there so you can again take some time to reflect and think. But can we say thank you to Boris and Malcolm in the first place in the usual way? Because that's been, been really excellent. Um, and next month we have um, two complete strangers to me. So this is going to be quite interesting. Um, a chap called Joe, Joe, Joe Jewhurst, who is no relative um, to the David Jewhurst, who is our, um, one of our, our vice president, um, from the Munich Center for Mathematical Philosophy, 
talking about the impact of cybernetics on contemporary cognitive science. Um, so that's going to be quite fun. Um, it's like a light-hearted um, thrash, I should imagine. And then Carl Sachs from Marymount University talking research on cybernetics, pragmatism, and cognitive science. So the cognitive science thread that seemed to come out this evening looks like it's going to come out again next month. So second Wednesday of October, I'll get it up on Eventbrite as soon as I possibly can. In the meanwhile, thank you all very much for coming. Thanks, Boris and Malcolm, again, and I'll speak to you all soon. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye.